Welcome home. Um, as you all know, we've been talking, we've been taking this time to specifically <coughs> reflect on our core beliefs and return to kind of the basics that have provided the foundation for the messages I preach, for our kind of our goals as a church. We don't have like this five-year business plan or anything, but um, it, we're trying to return to the idea of how we connect and strengthen our bonds with God however we, under, however we understand God. So for five weeks, I've been up here spouting about different concepts that influence the operations of Evolved Church. And for five weeks, I've reminded y'all and myself that it's not that we're saying you have to believe the same way. It's that if you're wondering what I'm up to, or, or you know, especially if you're caught on a message I'm giving, or you're like, what is going on? Or if you need to call me out on something, you're like, hey, your foundation beliefs say this, but you're preaching this weird fear stuff. What's going on? You know. But either way, it's, it's just to kind of give you some insight and to get you thinking about your own beliefs, too. So today we're going to review them, and those of you here in person, uh, if you didn't receive a copy of kind of, of a rundown of our beliefs, Curtis will bring you one. I think everyone has one, but um, I gave one per couple, or per yeah, couple. one per couple or something. Uh, but if you really can't stand the person next to you and want your own, then that's fine too. Have you had the quiz on that? Uh, I haven't. The quiz will just anyway. <laughs> this is the answer key. This is your crib sheet. Um, oh, here's the answer. Oh, wait. So today we're going to just kind of review them. And because in all of our previous, in all of my previous sermons leading up to this, I hit the scripture pretty hard to kind of like say, this is why, this is why, this is why, this is why, because I think that's important. But today I'm not going to be drilling the scriptural backing for it. It is, there is a, a bunch of the scriptural citations are at the bottom of that sheet but also you can always review the sermons or talk to me about it the sermons are on our youtube channel if there's a plug set up our youtube channel i think i have like three subscribers right now so um check out our youtube channel if you want to check out the the other sermons that go more in depth in the biblical backing of this but uh so i'm not going to rehash the reasons necessarily you believe that or the, or the backing of that but we will kind of tie it together and talk about how it works, how the beliefs kind of function as a group, if that makes sense. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your message today. May it be released within each and every one of us so that, that we can view just that other aspect of you or so that we can draw nearer to you. And may we leave with encouragement as well as maybe some challenge to to think about how we operate and how that reflects how our beliefs in, uh, affect our actions and how our actions reflect our beliefs, Lord. Help us to see the challenge, but also the encouragement today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So, how do you respond when people ask what you believe? Especially if what you believe, if, if you claim the label Christian, but you may not believe what some other mainstream, especially kind of in the evangelical world that, that this church somewhat operates in, if it's not on par with what's expected of that yeah. label. Yeah. How do you identify that? Well, I, I, one of the reasons I put that stuff in paper was just to give you some ideas on replies based on how I hope to reflect the general beliefs that Evolved Church. So it's just kind of a reference. You won't have to turn it in. You can throw it on your way out. You can take it home, hang it on your fridge. Do You know, it's whatever works for you. But the basic rundown is that we believe God is unconditional, inseparable love. God loves you. Amen. God will never leave you. And because of this love, because God is love, God ultimately will bring some kind of good out of everything that happens. Now, does that mean bad things won't happen? No. 
does that mean, you know, if we screw up enough, God will hate us and kick us down and burn us in hell for eternity? No. God is love. I mean, at least that's not my, I, I've always struggled with that idea. Oh, God loves you, but if you go too far, then God's love is going to be revealed in torment. Uh, okay, that's, you know, that's where we, you know, and then we call it tough love or whatever. There's a difference between boundaries and torture. Sure. But God is love. We believe Jesus was and is the Son of God. Jesus became flesh, taught all who would listen, and some who wouldn't, and left specific examples that were later recorded. Yes, Lord? <laughs> um, that Jesus came down and left specific examples of how to connect to this concept of God that, that before they had been trying to reach through other means. We believe Jesus came down to show us that, that way, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus demonstrated God's complete, reckless, unfathomable love for us in both his life and in his death. He allowed himself to be sacrificed in a brutal manner, but that wasn't all he did. Because Jesus lived, too. He showed that model. And that's a very important aspect that's often overlooked. Right. And yes, we believe Jesus suffered, died, and was buried. A death not to placate an angry, wrathful God. A death to demonstrate love to people who thought the only way to God was through blood. That's what Evolved Church stands for. Doesn't mean you have to agree or you can agree with pieces and not other. That's okay. Because the other thing, remember I said welcome home. This is just stuff to chew on. We believe Jesus rose from the dead and lives. And that demonstrates the power and desire of God for us all to live in eternity with them. We believe the Holy Spirit provides the help we need to connect, reconnect, and draw nearer to God, who is always pursuing us. We believe the Holy Spirit is our helper, our revealer of truth, and our own leader in guiding our actions toward the love that is God. The Holy Spirit converts the black and white syllables we read as scripture into the living actual word of, that's Jesus that is God within us. We believe the Holy Spirit is that connector, that conduit. We believe the Bible is God's love letter to us, that it includes the history, drama, humanity, and artistry of the ultimate love story. The Bible is an encouragement for us all to walk humbly and demonstrate God's own love. And when it comes to people, we believe humans are created in God's own image. All humans. And God has a vast number of images. That image supersedes anything related to physical characteristics, sex, gender, or any other constraints. You know, it's interesting that especially when it comes to how we define people and God's relationship to us, Often this church and those like us are accused of not being Bible believers. I kind of made a joke about it earlier. But I disagree with that accusation. Yes, we read, we discuss, we study, we believe in the Bible. Let me take out that little preposition in. We believe the Bible. We just apply a different lens than some do. And as I've mentioned many, many times, that lens makes all the difference in how we live here on earth. Sometimes applying that lens can be a little disorienting, can be a little painful. I got, is there, no, this, I got my, I got new glasses in, I have a new prescription. It's actually I, a little lower of a prescription, it's kind of weird, but anyway, I'm having trouble adapting. I have a migraine today. I'm having trouble focusing. I'm having trouble doing
doing things and that's, you'll hear me stutter, you'll hear me whatever. But that doesn't mean I didn't need glasses. That doesn't mean the lens is wrong. Maybe it is, but it's up to me to experience it and evaluate it for myself. And it's the same with our basic beliefs. It's, you know, I have the privilege of basically having started the church. It's basically my beliefs in a, at a corporate level in a, you know, with flexibility on the other stuff. Because you'll also notice there are things that are not included. I'm not going to worry about what we believe about hell or what you believe about hell or heaven or who goes and doesn't go and all that. We can chew on it, but if you're focused, if, if, I, if I stripped it down to the beliefs on that paper, do those others really matter more than the, the concept of philosophically having fun with you know, debating them or kicking them around or whatever? I don't think so, because if God is love and Jesus proved that love, by dying on a cross, not because God needed it, but because we did. And if the Holy Spirit is our connection to that love, then I'm going to be too busy, you know, trying to love on people than to fret over who's in and who's out and who's wearing the right shoes after Labor Day or whatever. <laughs> Carl. <laughs> yeah, tie-dye shoes are always, they could be always out of season or always in season, either way. Um, but see, that's how the lenses work. We believe in the Bible. We just view it differently, and we view it through the lens of kind of a backward lens of Christianity backward in time, chronologically. We view it through the lens of what Jesus talked about the Bible. When Jesus said, you've heard it said, but I tell you this, he was quoting the Bible, or what we now call the Bible. So yes, we're Bible believers. You don't have to shrink from that or be ashamed. Or maybe I'm talking to myself, you know. Because I went through a phase where someone would go, well, are you a Bible believing church? And I'd be like, well. Yeah. And now I go, yeah, we are. <laughs> and if they go, well, no, not what you, well, yeah, that's in the Bible. So if you're gonna throw these, you know, black and white questions at me, I can give you black and white answers. But God operates, operates best in the gray. Because isn't that where love grows the best? Love is not necessarily defined by actions or defined by, by time or, you know, it just is. And sometimes it hurts. And sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it's cliche and la, 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 la. And sometimes it's so deep, you can't describe it. We don't use the Bible as a weapon to <laughs> I said we don't use the Bible as a weapon to exclude. We use the Bible as a tool to include. Amen. You want to preach next week? <laughs> sure. He's preaching next week. He was already going to preach next week. <laughs> but yes. But you can look at a Bible either way. You can look at it as a weapon if you choose. We choose to look at it as a tool to, I won't say it like that, to include people. There's a garden, a gardening implement. And see, the, the reason they all go together is that one view builds and spins off the other. We become, uh, I wish I remembered the name of this, I wanna say his name was Eckhart, an author named Eckhart talks about this wheel within a wheel concept, that we are all sent people. And it's, we become that, it, it, it turns on each other. Like the pictures of atoms, with the, the protons and neutrons in the center, and the electrons all flinging around. We kind of do that, we work together. And that's how the beliefs work, together. And that's why I wanted to take at least one week to say, hey, they're not taken, you know, I did a week on each separate thing, but they work best as a whole. And it's not like we have to memorize each thing. It's just that they all tie. 
For example, we can build on the concept of the Bible as God's love letter, which also encompasses what we previously said about God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, that it connects. We then can also see that humans are creative out of and for love. Because our views of the Bible as a love story guide our acknowledgement of God himself or herself or themselves as unconditional, inseparable love. And because of these foundational concepts we can claim as truths, although we always honor the ability to reevaluate, we can live with a focus on reflecting the love only God can provide. We can break away from fear-based theology that brings violence and death that's much like the Old Testament where they were trying to earn God's favor and they really thought God was saying, here, kill, here, do this, here, do that. But God sent Jesus instead to say, no, that's not the point. See, we can break away from that fear. We can move beyond that to true relationships with God, however we view God and with ourselves, and with each other. And we can do so not as some little milk toast, you know, oh, love, ee. But we can do it with strength in the faith that we are loved completely. And that helps us spread that concept to allow people to live their own authentic lives and to forge their own authentic relationships with the God of their own understanding. And as that understanding changes, it's okay if God, quote unquote, changes. I don't believe God changes, but it's okay that the facets of God reflected through me can change. Am I allowed to ask questions? Sure, go ahead. I, I don't want to interrupt. Um, one thing is you were talking about hell and heaven and how you weren't going to get into it earlier. One thing I never understood is if a God is so selfless, how come you have to devote your life to worship? So if you don't worship God enough, you won't go to heaven? Yeah, like, I don't, like, if you're so selfless, why would you? Why does he need our worship? Yeah. That's a great question, and I, I have some responses, and I'll throw a couple of them out, but I want to get more into that. Okay. Because it's an awesome question, and it's not the first time I've heard it, and it's not the first time I've thought about it. You know, if God's so almighty on his own, why does he need us to go, praise you, God? Because isn't that the sign of like insecurity if I'm requiring that affirmation? Am I phrasing that? You know, is that a fair way to phrase your question? The short answer or the short response, I won't say answer, although I did, is uh, God doesn't need our praise. We need that, that concept of praising God because we need it to adjust our views. And I know that sounds kind of a cop out, but I'll I'll be glad to talk talk to you more about it, and I'll be glad to and, and I am chewing on that for a sermon topic too. So, but catch up with me after. But that's an awesome question. It's all good. Uh, but the idea of uh, you know, there's all this idea that love is somehow a weakness, some just touchy feely girly thing, but it's. There's really a strength in when you really know that you're loved. It's what we kind of crave with each other. And if I, but if I can acknowledge that someone so big loves me and and by viewing the beliefs the way I do, I don't have to say, well, only loves me because of Jesus or only loves me because this or only loves me if I sing loud enough or stand on my feet and wave just right. No, God loves me regardless, right. completely. And doesn't even have to overlook things. The things that I often label as sin are the things God still says, it's just a part of you. Do you want to grow past it? I'll help you. Do you want to grow past it in order to experience more abundance in your life? I'll help you. Yes, there are consequences for actions. But through love, there's just so much grace. And I can't give grace 
I mean, me personally, I, I'm so judgmental. And the, the more judgmental I catch myself being, it's usually because I don't believe that God could really love me. So I have to find reasons. And I'm like, well, God can love me because at least I'm not doing that. You know, I watch the serial killer stuff, true crime stuff. I'm like, well, at least I'm not that person. But honestly, you know, you, first, you kind of first have to acknowledge that God loves you before you can get over your own judgment of God's capabilities of grace or can and cannot, who God can and cannot love. Do you follow me there? So that's why I go so much into the love thing, and that's why it's a basic. And that love is the same love that Jesus demonstrated when he said on the cross, it is finished. The need to sacrifice is finished. The need to compete is finished. Those were human created concepts that God said, okay, if that's what it takes for you to get to me, fine. And then when, when people had kind of maxed it out and God's like, see, <laughs> he's like, try it this way. And still people attacked because Jesus came and they said, oh, but you're not the Messiah we expected. You didn't come and attack and compete and do the things we expected. And it still happens. But I digress. See, the need for blood is finished. And that means the need to fear is finished. The need to prove our own righteousness is finished. We can acknowledge our own areas of need and want to go beyond that to gain that more abundance, as I talked about a moment ago. And we can want personal improvement, not to upstage anyone, not to impress some deity up there throwing lightning bolts at us, but just to get more abundance. Just to get, and by abundance, I mean like, more of the ability Paul talked about when he said, you know, I can be content in any circumstance. You can't really be content in circumstances if, if there's not something bigger you're enjoying right now. If all I'm doing is looking forward to dying to fly away and I'm going to endure life so that someday I can have crowns and whatever things of gold and gaudy, I don't know. If that's all my goal, I'm going to have a miserable life. And then I'm going to, you know, maybe I'll get to heaven and be like, well, this was great, but what was the point of all that misery back there just to prove I could endure? Nah, at least I don't think so. You're welcome to think that. And if that's what helps you, sometimes that's a step toward other things. And that's okay. But for me, when Jesus said it is finished, that my need to prove anything is finished. That's why I don't, I, I try to avoid debates or arguments. I'll discuss stuff all the time, but... I don't need to, to go to some other church and, and stand on their corner and tell them they're wrong and all this. If they want to say I'm going to hell, they can say it. It doesn't make it true. So That's why I joke and say, well, welcome to my handbasket. <laughs> you know, if you want to condemn people, you're going to find reasons to condemn them. If you want to um, praise or support people, you're going to find reasons to praise and support. Just like if you want to use this as a weapon, you're going to find ways. If you want to use it as a tool, you're going to find ways. So to... Hmm. So the idea becomes not earning anything, but improving ourselves so that we can be just better people for ourselves and for others. Whether that means physical health, mental health, spiritual health, all of it. We strive for improvement. We don't lean back and go, well, then nothing matters. I'm just going to do what I want. Well, you will for a while. That's kind of normal growth. But you'll realize that that's kind of empty. And so to get that abundance, that's why we do still want to grow and improve and come to church and help and, and do all those things. And that's what's called spiritual maturity. And that increases our interactions and the depth of our interactions with the Holy Spirit. And that helps us share that love. Not because we have to convert anyone. It is finished. We don't have to check off boxes. But just because we want to share the good news, because for us it finally really becomes good news. 
And we can't help but share that love, that message. And that's what I believe that belief statements are all about. But again, you're welcome to believe differently. Let us pray.